Unit 731 was a biological and chemical warfare research and development unit of the Japanese Imperial Army that engaged in horrible and inhumane experimentation on hundreds of thousands of people beginning in 1937. Today, we'll discuss these atrocities, as well as the brutality of the Nanking Massacre that occurred during the Second Sino-Japanese War and was a precursor to the horrors of Unit 731. Simply put, we've done it again. We've officially hit the worst of the worst. I'm Mike. I'm Ian. And I'm Dave. If you're looking for the worst human depravity imaginable, stick around. You've come to the right place. This is Necronomapod. A nurse about 20 years old stood beside the operating table. It wasn't quiet. Everyone was laughing and joking, just as usual. Then the experiment started. This time, the victim was a Chinese man. I don't know how he was captured. We didn't care whether he was innocent or not. Someone pushed him hard and he cried, kneeling on the ground, struggling backward. I also pushed him really hard. Later, he seemed exhausted and gave up hope. The nurse said to him in Chinese that he could sleep and that the anesthetic would prevent any pain. He walked slowly towards the operating table and laid on it. Altogether, six experiments were conducted on him. Okay, so off the bat, well, first off the bat, cheers. Cheers. My, my Miller Lite ready to go. Uh, it's probably only fair we start this episode off with a quick disclaimer, as we do for some of our episodes. This, uh, this subject uh, contains a lot of uh, pretty intense, graphic, violent content, uh, including um, rape and murder and torture involving um, children and women, uh, pregnant ladies, um, elderly. So uh, just wanted to give out a quick discretion. As always, uh, with these subjects, listener discretion is advised. This content might not be for everyone. So um, listen accordingly. Uh, we put it in your hands, but just wanted to give you a quick update and a, a disclaimer on that. So listener discretion is advised for this episode. That being said, a couple house cleaning things. I was recently notified on Twitter there is another website selling our merchandise illegally. Motherfuckers. I think we've they're made like it. ripping off our stuff. Yeah, I think you made it at that point, right? When they're yes. trying to make money off you? Knockoffs. So just a reminder to everybody, our official merchandise, our clothing is only available on Amazon. Go to Amazon.com, search Necronomapod. That's the only place to get our clothing merchandise. We have stickers also available on our own website, necronomapod.com. We have plenty of stickers left. Uh, we still have that sale going. We've had it going for quite a while now. So three, a three pack of stickers for, uh, what is it, Dave? 704. 704. Happy birthday, America. Boom. You deserve it. <laughs> so we got stickers available on necronomapod.com and our merchandise available on Amazon. If you see our stuff on any other site, do not buy from them. They are stealing from us. So just wanted to put that disclaimer out there. And uh, thank you to the gentleman who sent us the, uh, the link to that site. They will be receiving a cease and desist letter from us. And a knuckle sandwich. And a knuckle sandwich. We could find them. Bastards. Yeah, not great. So, so any hoodles. What else is going on, guys? Well, <laughs> you know, with the COVID going on, currently not, locked down. Yeah, not much. And I'm not going to... Uh, I'm not going to... Um, you know, sit around and watch new movies because I don't watch movies. We all know that. That's oh, well documented. Of course. You know, all those classics out there I haven't seen. Instead, I like to go back and rewatch shows that I like. You know, Californication, sure. The Office, Curb Your Enthusiasm, which I'm currently watching. Excellent. And you're a big fan, Dave. Ian, you have not watched Curb Your Enthusiasm. No, I haven't. I highly recommend it. I would it. put forth that it's the funniest show that's ever been on television. It doesn't have a bad really? season. It does not have a bad season. And they're 10 in. Just signed for an 11th season. Can I go wrong? Do you like Seinfeld, Ian? No. Okay. He's not going to like it. <laughs> well, maybe. If you don't like Seinfeld, you will not like Curb Your Enthusiasm. So Seinfeld no. was good because Larry David wrote it, not right. because Jerry Seinfeld was funny. I think Jared Seinf was a mix, Jerry Seinfeld's but... stand-up is funny. His right. actual stand-up, I like. Some of it. The show. Larry yeah, wrote Larry the David, show. The, the, the writing is phenomenal. Yeah. yeah. And so Curb is essentially just that, more like brought to like kind of life, I guess, kind of. Like yeah. it's. Larry David's life. Just 10 times better. And fun. Yeah. <laughs> and inappropriate and hilarious. So anyways, I was watching it recently and season nine 
I believe episode five, <laughs> he takes a lady on a date to the movies. And they're standing in line at the little gimmick counter where, you know, you buy your treats or whatever. Right. And he goes, she's like, I'm going to go to the bathroom. He goes, okay, what do you want? And she said, I want Reese's Pieces, Junior Mints, Milk Duds, and a large popcorn. And then we open them all up. You dump them in the popcorn. (laughs) And it's the best movie snack ever. And he's like, you're fucking out of your mind because you don't mix mix sweet and savory. And I 100% agree with him. You do not mix sweet and savory, in my opinion. Junior Mints, Reese Pieces, Milk Duds, all mixed into the popcorn. She's making like her own little, uh, mm. what is it, like a, not a Chex Mix, her own little I don't hate dish. it. My question to you, Dave and Ian, what is the perfect movie snack? Mm. You're curled up on the couch. You got your onesie on. You're snuggled. You're ready to watch a movie. You have your little glass of wine next to you. What snack do you have while you're watching a movie? Or you can answer if you're in a theater. Dave, I don't. I know you don't like theaters. I don't appreciate a the theater experience. Perfect movie snack. I personally eat a lot of popcorn. So every movie I watch involves popcorn. Okay. So that's, uh, that's my go-to. Question. On those days where you're like having a couch day and you're binging all of the Academy Award nominated best pictures, <laughs> are you having a bag of popcorn for each movie? Mm. Or is there like a mix of pizza and Thai and Chipotle? And- There's some junk food supplemented <laughs> by a couple of different bowls of popcorn, sure. With some, Each uh, movie has its own meal or snack. With some cheddar cheese uh, seasoning sprinkled in the popcorn. Yeah. Some I went, white cheddar. We looked for that this weekend. Sold out everywhere. Well, Can't find it's it. good stuff. So you're going popcorn? Uh, every time, sure. Okay. If you're going to go sweet, what do you go to? Mm. You think, Ian, what do you got? Popcorn and snow caps. Snow, mm. not mixed though. Or do no, you mix? No, no. Oh, but I would, if I had to pick between the two, I would take the snow caps over the popcorn. So snow caps seems like a movie theater snack. Are you getting eating those at home as well, or is that when you're at the theater? Oh no, that's when I'm at the theater. Okay, the snow caps. I like snow. So caps. you're paying what eighteen dollars for a box of snow caps or something like that? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what about at home if you're on the couch? What are you doing? Just popcorn. All right. I don't mind door dashing some uh, Dairy Queen sometimes if there I'm in go. the mood for something sweet. Get a good blizzard or something? Sure. What's your go-to blizzard? Heath Bar. That's good. Or Butterfinger. I like Butterfinger. Either one of those. I'm a big fan of Milk Duds, so if I'm going a sweet snack, I'm going Milk Duds. Right. I do love Milk Duds. Popcorn, also delicious. But it's got to be loaded with butter and salt or like one of those gimmick butters like you have with the, like the cheddar cheese. It's not the butter. Spray. It's just the seasoning. Just the, oh, I'm sorry. Also, just like a cheese popcorn is good that you can buy like in the grocery store. Sure, I like that as well. Or the the half and half mix like you get in Chicago. I forget the name of it. It's as long as it's not sweet and savory. I'll fight a motherfucker. Sweet and savory, yeah. No, fuck that. It's I got delicious. no time. It's the same reason why pineapple doesn't belong on pizza. They just don't mix. <laughs> Anyways, all right. So that's our snack talk. It's good stuff. And that's about where the fun ends for this episode. It's not great. I mean, I think it's an important story to tell, though. I don't think. I get the feeling a lot of people in this country are not aware of the story. And I, you know, and it's not something that they necessarily should be aware of. Like, it's just not talked about. It's part of history. It should be taught more, more so than it is. I think the Holocaust stuff overshadows it, but this is sure. Nonetheless, just as horrific. When I say should, I don't mean that they shouldn't be aware of it. I meant like, there's no reason why they would know of it because it's not in textbooks. That's, That's right. You're not seeing a ton of documentaries on this. You know, it's not, it's not everyday knowledge, you know, Holocaust everyday knowledge. Yeah. Well, you know, generally Americans just don't know stuff. Also that. It's not American <laughs> history. Why do we give a fuck? That's the attitude. Exactly right. So, all right. Well, let's get sad. Ian, take it away. So to understand the atrocities of Unit 731, we first need to take a brief look at the history behind the Japanese's strong hatred of the Chinese and the Nanking Massacre to get an idea of the brutality that was happening outside of Unit 731 in the fighting of the Second Sino-Japanese War. From 1600 to 1868, in the Takagawa period, Japan ended a long period of civil war and began to grow as a unified and stable state. This period saw the beginning of removing foreign influences on Japanese culture, including the Chinese. During this time, Japan maintained a policy of self-isolation, so its culture developed with little to no foreign influence. Have you guys ever seen uh, Last Samurai? Uh, is that with Tom Cruise? Yeah. No, I, I have, haven't. actually. So that was right around this time period when the, like, the last right. Shogun and 
I forgot all, all about that was that going movie. away. That was a good movie, wasn't it? It's a great I think movie. I saw that a long time ago. I love samurai stuff, so yeah. A rise in national self-respect in this time resulted in Japan viewing itself as the center of a, quote, civilized world surrounded by barbarians. This viewpoint would only grow stronger towards the Chinese by the end of the First Sino-Japanese War. The First Sino-Japanese War lasted from July 25th, 1894 to April 17th, 1895, between the Qing Dynasty of China and the Empire of Japan, primarily over the influence in Korea. The Empire of Japan would win this war, causing a major blow to the Qing Dynasty. As time passed, Japan pursued a policy of aggressive westernization and industrialization, and by doing so was able to catch up with the progress of western nations. Meanwhile, China was sinking into a state of deep dysfunction. China began to be perceived as a declining power, and the Japanese increasingly lost respect for China, to eventually viewing them as subhuman. Well, that's the first step in propaganda towards uh, being able to treat people like that. Yeah, when you get into that ter territory of people aren't really people anymore. That, absolutely. The Second Sino-Japanese War started between the Republic of China and the Empire of Japan on July 7th, 1937. The start of the war was typically considered to be the Marco Polo Bridge incident in 1937, in which a dispute between Japanese and Chinese troops escalated into a full-scale invasion. Ian, is it true that that happened because they both had their eyes closed when they were crossing the bridge? They were going, Marco, <laughs> Polo, and they kept bumping into each other because no one could see each other? <laughs> it's, it's well documented in history books. <laughs> okay. that that's exactly how it happened. <laughs> you a big fan of the Marco Polo game day? Was sure, that your game sure, as a kid? Sure, sure. Yeah. Marco Polo champion of Cleveland, Ohio. I like that commercial they have right now where the kids are playing Marco Polo in the pool and, and Marco Polo's in the pool. He's like, uh, excuse, excuse. <laughs> well, then just make it excuse, excuse. Now I want to watch Euro Trip. Excuse. <laughs> What's that commercial even for? Fucking Geico or some shit. I don't know. Probably as they do have clever commercials. <laughs> it's like I'm right in front of you. Excuse. <laughs> Some sources in the modern People's Republic of China date the beginning of the war to the Japanese invasion of Manchuria in 1931. And that's a, that was one of the interesting things with reading through this is there's a lot of like modern revisionists that say some of this stuff didn't happen, like on the Japanese side and then the Chinese side, you know, they, they both sides have different viewpoints on what everything we're about to get into. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah. Well, that 1931 invasion of Manchuria, they essentially just took it over and formed and created their own like puppet state of Japan, I, if I remember correctly. So yeah, that very well could be the start of hostilities. Invading a, someone's country usually makes people unhappy. You would think that that might <laughs> ruffle some feathers, so to speak. Four months into the Second Sino-Japanese War, saw one of the most devastating acts of war crimes in human history, known as the Nanking Massacre or the Rape of Nanking leaving an estimated 300,000 dead, mainly civilians. That's fucking terrifying. And Nanking was the, was the uh, capital of China at this time, so it's just it's a brutal. big place. Yeah. yeah, This is where things in, not get very fun. No. In August 1937, the Japanese army invaded Shanghai, where they were met with strong resistance and suffered heavy casualties. The battle was bloody as both sides faced urban hand-to-hand -hand combat. By mid-November, the Japanese had captured Shanghai with the help of naval and aerial attacks, and on December 1st, Japanese headquarters ordered the Central China Area Army and the 10th Army to capture Nanking, which was, like you said, Dave, the, ca or the capital of the Republic of China. Yeah. yeah wow, spoiler alert, Dave. Jeez. We're oh, getting to that. Sorry. <laughs> Well, he had to go just flaunt his knowledge. He well, knows. I'm just, you know, most people know Beijing as the capital, just pointing out that Nanking was at that time. Although the massacre is generally described as having occurred over a six-week period after the fall of Nanking, the crimes committed by the Japanese army were not limited to that period. Many atrocities were reported to have committed as the Japanese army advanced from Shanghai to Nanking. According to one Japanese journalist, quote, the reason that the 10th Army is advancing to Nanking quite rapidly is due to the tacit consent among the officers and men that they could loot and rape as they wish. Goddamn. The atrocity that stands out the most is the Japanese advance to Nanking, 
was a killing contest between two Japanese officers, as reported in a Japanese newspaper and an English language Japanese newsletter. The contest was a race between two officers to see who could kill a hundred people first by using only a sword. It was covered like a sporting event with regular updates on the score over a series of days. The contest continued because neither had killed a hundred people. By the time they had arrived at, the, at Zaijin Mountain, one had killed 105 people while the other had killed 106. Both officers supposedly surpassed their goal during the fighting, making it impossible to determine which one had actually won the contest. Therefore, according to journalists, on December 13th, they decided to begin another contest to kill 150 people. And uh, safe to say they weren't just uh, counting soldiers. This was just open. Oh, God, no. uh, you know, open range on anybody they walk past. Well, yeah, they were subhumans, remember? Yeah. Both of those guys got executed for war crimes later on, just by the way. Good. Fuck them. Mike, you had a similar game in college with your sword, didn't you? Slay all day, that was called. <laughs> Very uncomfortable <laughs> making that connection with these guys. <laughs> I did have my own game. Uh, I was not killing anybody, but let's just say people saw heaven, found God. <laughs> Of course they did. And apparently had deep connection with Jesus the way they were calling out his name. But yes, <laughs> it's in fact true. Uh, and also for the record, 150 people is a fucking cakewalk. I got to 207. <laughs> that was your freshman year. Well, obviously. Eyewitness accounts of Westerners and Chinese present at Nanking in the weeks after the fall of the city say that over the course of six weeks following the fall of Nanking, Japanese troops engaged in mass rape, murder, torture, theft, arson, and other war crimes. Some of these primary accounts, including the diaries of John Rabe, who was a German affiliated with the Nazi party, and American, Minnie Vautrin, came from foreigners who opted to stay behind to protect the Chinese civilians from harm. And what was set up here was like, it was called the Nanking safe zone. So if the, it was kind of agreed upon that the Japanese would not kill Westerners. Ch the Chinese were free game, but in this safe zone yeah. with the, you know, with John Rabb and the other Westerners that were in there, they were off limits. Was that also true after Pearl Harbor though? As far as Americans were concerned, I wonder. Uh, no, when we when we get into Unit Seven Thirty One, there were, uh, you know, it was mainly Chinese, but there were some Americans that ended up in Unit Seven Thirty One. Yeah, yeah, if you're available, I'm sure they weren't discriminating by then. Other accounts include first person testimonies of Nanking massacre survivors, eyewitness reports of journalists, both Western and Japanese, as well as the field diaries of military personnel. American missionary John McGee stayed behind to provide a 16 millimeter film documentary and firsthand photographs of the Nanking massacre. No, thank you. Mm, that'd be hard to watch. Just looking at photographs, like for like us to post on the social media stuff. It's rough. I'm not posting 90% of the stuff that's no, out there. Yeah. It's disgusting. It is estimated that 20,000 women, including some children and elderly, were raped during the occupation. A large number of the rapes were done systematically by Japanese soldiers as they went from door to door searching for girls, with many women being captured and gang raped. The women were often killed immediately after being raped, often by penetrating their vaginas with bayonets, long sticks of bamboo, or other objects. Young children were not exempt from these atrocities, and if they were too small, their vaginas were cut open with bayonets to allow Japanese soldiers to rape them. I, I mean, we've talked about a lot of terrible things in this show. That's probably the worst thing that we've I've, that ever, is, I've ever read. That is the worst sentence that has ever been read on this podcast. I don't disagree. I don't think there will. We say it all the time, but I don't think there's anything that will top that sentence I just read. Yeah. It's just, it's unimaginable. Mm. On December 19th, 1937, the Reverend James N. McCollum wrote in his diary, quote, I know not where to end. Never have I heard or read such brutality. Rape, rape, rape. We estimate at least a thousand cases a night and many by day. In case of resistance or anything like that seems like disapproval, there is a bayonet stab or a bullet. People are hysterical. Women are being carried off every morning, afternoon, and evening. 
the whole Japanese army seems to be free to go and come as it pleases and to do whatever it pleases. On March 7th, 1938, Robert O. Wilson, a surgeon at the University Hospital in the safety zone administrated by the United States, wrote in a letter to his family, quote, a conservative estimate of people slaughtered in cold blood is somewhere about 100,000, including, of course, thousands of soldiers that had thrown down their arms. Here are two excerpts from his letters of December 15th and December 18th, 1937, to his family. Quote, The slaughter of civilians is appalling. I could go on for pages telling of cases of rape and brutality almost beyond belief. Two be... Two bayoneted corpses are the only survivors of seven street cleaners who were sitting in their headquarters when Japanese soldiers came in without warning or reason and killed five of their number and wounded the two that found their way to the hospital. Next quote. Let me recount some instances occurring in the last two days. Last night, the house of one of the Chinese staff members of the university was broken into and two of the women, his relatives, were raped. Two girls, about 16, were raped to death in one of the refugee camps. In the university middle school, where there are 8,000 people, the Japs came in 10 times last night, over the wall, stole food, clothing, and raped until they were satisfied. They bayoneted one little boy of eight who had five bayonet wounds, including one that penetrated his stomach. I think he will live. Well, that's on the ground reporting, huh? They, I mean, they had free reign. There was yeah. no oversight. They could do whatever they want. Imagine the horror living in, in, you know, here, being one of the, the, the Chinamen that, you know, they just come in and how do you protect yourself? How do you protect your kids? You don't, you don't. Your babies. I mean, there's lots of stories like this of the Japanese. In the, I mean, do you remember the, the story with the, uh, they called them comfort women? I mean, they took, you know, like 400,000 women from China and Korea to be prostitutes for yeah. the Japanese army. Right. It's just, it's crazy. What do you do in this situation? If they're breaking in, you know, you know they're jumping walls, they're coming into your house. I don't are know. Are you man. killing your family to save them the rape and the carnage? Or are you I mean Poss- or, possibly because you know if you fight them, you're going to get killed and then they're gonna have free reign still. Like I I don't know how you answer know, that question. That's what I was yeah, thinking I, about when I was going through this. Like you almost rather control it yourself and just put everyone out of their misery. You wanna say you'd fight back, but you're gonna lose. If you're by yourself, I think you go out fighting. Oh, absolutely. But, absolutely. Yeah, I don't yeah. I think you might have to do some putting to sleep of people before it comes to that. Yeah, I don't know. It's a fucked up conversation you have, but anyways. There's no good answer. I don't know. In his diary kept during the aggression against the city and its occupation by the Imperial Japanese Army, the leader of the safety zone, John Rabb, wrote many comments about the Japanese atrocities. On December 17th, he wrote, quote, Two Japanese soldiers have climbed over the garden wall and are about to break into our house. When I appear, they give the excuse that they saw two Chinese soldiers climb over the wall. When I show them my party badge, they return the same way. In one of the houses in the narrow street behind my garden, a woman was raped and then wounded in the neck with a bayonet. I managed to get an ambulance so we can take her to Kulu Hospital. Last night, up to a thousand women and girls are said to have been raped. About a hundred girls at Ginling College alone. You hear nothing but rape. If husbands or brothers intervene, they're shot. What you hear and see on all sides is the brutality and bestiality of the Japanese soldiers. Well, at least the Nazi was safe, right? Thank goodness. He lived. Yeah, right. That's good. Following the capture of Nanking, a massacre by the Imperial Japanese Army led to the deaths of up to 60,000 residents in the city a figure that's difficult to accurately calculate due to the many bodies deliberately burnt, buried in mass graves, or deposited in the Yangtze River. Soon after the fall of the city, Japanese troops made a thorough search for Chinese soldiers and arrested thousands of young Chinese men. Many were taken to the Yangtze River, where they were machine gunned to death. In what was probably the single largest massacre of Chinese troops, the Straw String Gorge Massacre, occurred along the banks of the Yangtze River on December 18th. For most of the morning, Japanese soldiers tied the the POWs' hands together. At dusk, soldiers divided POWs into four columns and opened fire. It took an hour to kill all the POWs and even longer for the Japanese to go around and bayonet each one of them to make sure that they were dead. 
the majority of the bodies were dumped directly into the Yangtze River. Just try to visualize that scene. I mean, my God, an hour. And from what I was reading, like the estimates of the Straw String Gorge Massacre was, it was well over 2,000 mm. POWs. So it took from morning till dusk to tie all these guys up and then shoot them all and then bayonet over a thousand people. Mm. What do you think the Yangtze River looked like at that point? Yeah. Like it was just red and filled with bodies. Like, doesn't it clog the river? Like, functionally, how I mean, does that work? I don't know. Mm. I mean, it's a pretty big river, I guess, if, they, yeah. if it's taking them some time. Damn. Our river catches fire. Their river is full of bodies. I guess we don't have it so bad here. <laughs> I guess we don't. In Cleveland. Jesus. So now let's so start now the story. Yes, yeah, so <laughs> that's that a good preamble. Yeah. How, Jesus. Yeah, how brutal this fighting was, uh, you know, how brutal the Japanese army was. Get into Unit 731, who was responsible for another estimated 300,000 deaths itself. Mm. In 1932, Surgeon General Shiro Aishi, chief medical officer for the Imperial Japanese Army, was placed in a command of the Army Epidemic Prevention Research Laboratory. Aishi organized a secret research group, the Togo Unit, for various chemical and biological experimentation in Manchuria. Ishii had proposed the creation of a Japanese bio biological and chemical research unit in 1930 after a two-year study trip abroad on the grounds that Western powers were developing their own programs. So I was reading that they that everyone signed the Geneva Protocol Treaty in 1925, which banned you know chemical warfare and chemical weapons, biological weapons. So it's then that they got really uh, into it because they figured if if we were if the world was going to ban it, they must be pretty effective. So they were like, "Let's we might I mean, as well start working on that." Yeah. Then you can't deny the logic, I guess. One of Ishii's main supporters inside the army was Colonel Chiahiko Koizumi, who later became Jap Japan's health minister from 1941 to 1945. Koizumi had joined a secret poison gas research committee in 1915 during World War I, when he and other Imperial Japanese Army officers became impressed by the successful German use of, of chlorine gas, in which Allies suffered 5,000 deaths and 15,000 wounded as a result of this chemical attack. Unit Togo was implemented in the Zogma Fortress, a prison-slash-experimentation camp in a village south of Harbin on the South Manchuria Railway. In autumn 1934, a jailbreak which jeopardized the facility's secrecy, along with a later explosion that was believed to be sabotage in 1935, led to Ishii shutting down the Zogma Fortress. He received the authorization to move to Pingfang, south of Harbin, to set up a new and much larger facility. In 1936, Emperor Hirohito authorized the expansion of this unit and its integration into the Kwangtung Army as the Epidemic Prevention Department. You know who it could use one of those, Ian? The United States exactly. of America. <laughs> yeah. We don't appear to have one of those functioning properly. That's a correct statement. <laughs> Something's not working. <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> it was divided at the same time into the Ishii unit and the Wakamatsu unit with a base in sinking. From August 1940, the units were known collectively as the Epidemic Prevention and Water Purification Department of the Kwangtung Army, or Unit 731 for short. Water Purification Department. Mm. Sounds all right, right? That's legit. <laughs> Couldn't be anything bad going on in there, mm. right? It's for the betterment of the Japanese people. Yeah. A special project, codenamed Maruda, used human beings for experiments. Test subjects were gathered from the surrounding population and were sometimes referred to as Maruda, which literally translates to logs, used in such contexts as, quote, how many logs fell. This term originated as a joke on the part of the staff because the official cover story for the facility given to the local authorities was that it was a lumber mill. However, an account by a man who worked as a junior uninformed civilian employee of the Imperial Japanese Army in Unit 731 the project was internally called Holzklotz, which is the German word for log. So even further dehumanizing. They're not even viewed as people. Yeah, just They're just called, wood. literally called logs. Yeah, log. In further parallel, the corpses of, quote, sacrificed subjects were disposed of by incineration. 
researchers in Unit 731 also published some of their results in peer-reviewed journals, writing as though the research had been conducted on non-human primates called, quote, Manchurian monkeys or, quote, long-tailed monkeys. There's more subhuman language. All right. We'll be right back. We like to drink beer. A lot of it. After a long night of drinking and talking crime and conspiracies, there's nothing that wakes us up and gets us ready to start the day better than just brew coffee. With a great selection of roast levels to choose from, you're guaranteed to find one that suits your style. Small batch roasted to highlight the unique features of each coffee bean, Just Brew Coffee caters to both casual and hardcore coffee drinkers alike. Since 2010, Just Brew Coffee has worked tirelessly to perfect the roasting process and technique, which has resulted in seriously delicious, always flavorful, and never bitter tasting coffee. If you're already drinking JBC, raise your mug. If you're not, raise your standards. Check out their online store at youjustbrew.com and up your coffee game today. Use code NECRO15 to receive 15% off your order of two pounds or more. And remember, they roast, you just brew. Today's episode of Necronomapod is brought to you by Beardology. There are a lot of imitators out there, but there's only one place I buy my beard oil. Beardology beard oil nourishes your skin and won't leave you with that greasy feel. With over 17 cents available in their extensive product line, I trust my beard to Beardology. You can find Beardology at beardology.co. Use code NECRO15 to receive 15% off your purchase. Beardology, discover the best way to avoid the shave. The test subjects were selected to give a wide cross-section of the population and included common criminals, captured bandits, anti-Japanese partisans, political prisoners, the homeless and mentally handicapped, and also people rounded up by the Japanese military police for alleged, quote, suspicious activities. Mm, suspicious activities. In- mm. <laughs> Take some liberties with that one, mm-hmm. huh? Yeah, that's just... I mean, nobody would do that, we're just gonna right? just going to grab like, you. Yeah, I mean... No law enforcement agency would ever do anything like that. That's the modern equivalent of disorderly conduct. <laughs> mm-hmm. They included infants, men, the elderly, and pregnant women. The members of the unit, approximately 300 researchers, included doctors and bacteriologists. Many had been desensitized to performing cruel experiments from their experience in animal research. I understand being desensitized. No, I don't understand, but you're desensitized because of animal research. But now we're talking about human beings. And I know they've made them subhuman, mm-hmm. but they're still human beings. Like they have the ability to communicate with you. So I, I don't think that's like the fact that they're desensitized. No, I think they're just evil human beings, I think. That's, a, that's interesting. You don't think they took the Hippocratic Oath over there? Yeah, no. <laughs> no, probably not. Probably not a lot of, you know, anything. I mean, the psychology behind this is an interesting part of this all. What do you got for us, Dave? Yeah, because this is something that I always, anytime I look into World War II stuff, you know, with the Holocaust or, or this subject, generally a whole country wouldn't have that many murderers in it that would be willing to commit the, these types of things. So it's something I always wonder about is like, what made people just turn into absolute monsters during this time period? Well, and I was looking at some of that, and it, it's a product of what they call groupthink, where you just do decision making as a group, and you're essentially taking the blame away off of individuals and putting it on the group, and it just leads towards a lot of bad decisions. And then coupled with you know propaganda from the state, blaming you know this group for all your troubles, dehumanizing them, calling them subhumans, it just leads to like an us or them, us versus them attitude, and you know you start viewing them as not. A person and just in the way of your aims of your country or your success or your happiness or whatever and it, it's really crazy though but there's it happens all the time there's so many instances of this and I, I think the scary part is that this it could probably happen anywhere mm, like in America right now uh, yeah mm, interesting <laughs> <laughs> I mean people are essentially sheep for the most part I think you know you don't want to be seen out of step with your community. And when your community I think that's starts very much true. Yes. going along with it, then, then you do too, because you don't want to be the outlier. Like, what's the most recent one in uh, in uh, Rwanda, right? In the 90s? Yeah. Where the government just started broadcasting radio messages, all kinds of stuff about the, uh, what was it, the uh, the Hutus vilifying the Tutsis. And they, they massacred like 800,000 of them in, in three months. 
and yeah. they had all lived together in villa, you know, next door to each other. They were neighbor killing neighbor. It's crazy what people can do. Oh, and I think even you know, kind of going on that same line of thinking, like that's the reason why cults end up becoming what they are because it's that group thinking. You know, like with Scientology or Jonestown or whatever, sure. you're forced to think the way as everyone else because you don't want to be the outcast. You're intimidated in some ways. You don't want to be someone that's, you know, raped or shot like they're doing here. Mm -hmm. So it's, you know, that's why cults thrive is because you get in and then you just, it's the group thinking aspect. Then you become fucking billionaires like Scientology and you control the country. But I guess to a certain point as a soldier, don't you have to dehumanize the enemy? I mean, just to allow yourself to kill them? I mean, isn't that part of war? Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, the I would civilian argue, aspect is different, I would, obviously. But I don't know if I, I can't put myself in that mindset because I'm not, you know, I've never been in the military. Yeah. I don't think I would dehumanize the enemy. I think I, I feel like I would uh, feel like with every kill, I'm killing a human and that would morally affect me. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. Do they put themselves in a, in a, in a I mean, it's kill or be killed, but I don't know if that's dehumanizing them. I don't know. That's an interesting question. Yeah. I would like to think that if you're a good soldier, you're not dehumanizing the enemy. You're seeing them as as someone that you, you might you have to fight against. Yeah, I, I don't know. I, I, this is worse than a soldier fighting a soldier, though. Like it, this is, it is. Yeah, absolutely. and most of these people are just innocent people. And if you're dehumanizing the enemy, then you might be going like this, going above and beyond, and then just killing everyone on their side. Yeah. So I don't know. I, but again, I, I, I'm speaking out of just what I would like to think. I don't know. And this is just such cruel and up and in your face, you know, torture and, and, right. and murder. Could you do that to you could do that to your a, a rival soldier if you dehumanize them? Right. You know, I like to think a good soldier, if someone surrenders, you're not going to kill them. You're going to take them as a prisoner of war. Right? Yeah. You're not just going to go no. torture and Sometimes. rape them. <laughs> you, I mean, you would think that's what they're going to do. I mean, I'm sure. I know it doesn't happen. I mean, a lot but, of American POWs in this war, the Japanese treated horrifically and executed and tortured. I understand, but I'm just arguing in general the point of do you dehumanize your enemy? At what point then? So then as soon as they surrender, are they back to a human again? Because if you're dehumanizing them at that point when they surrendered, you just shoot them and then they're dead. I, I don't know. Yeah, it's interesting. So I guess my question then is, say... The guys that flew the Enola Gay over Hiroshima and opened that hatch that incinerated 100,000 people. Don't you have to, in essence, dehumanize those people in order to be able to do something like that? I mean, so what's the difference, really? I would argue, I mean, I, I don't know what their mindset is. I can't speak to that. I would argue that, I mean, their belief in the American mindset was they were saving lives by ending the war. So you go in it with that mindset that's, as opposed to... That's the argument, sure. But as opposed to they're dehumanizing. You're still it. incinerating 100,000 civilians. Yeah. I, What's I, the difference? I just... I, I don't know. I think there's a difference between that and also just torturing and raping them. There is, but you still... And making games out of it, you know. But I think the Japanese will tell you they were doing it in the name of science and and to learn about ways to better help Well, and Japanese. broadcasting their kills like Sports Center. Well... Yeah, I, I don't... I think it's very interesting. I don't know. I And... I, who am I to say? I've not been in war. I don't know what yeah. that's like. It's just points to think about. It's just the human capacity to be able to inflict cruelty on other people. It's just, it's unbelievable. And, and I think you, you mentioned this, but I, I think you're right. I think you could find people in this country on both sides right now that would have no problem murdering the other side because they view them as an enemy of the state. Oh, absolutely. No doubt about it. So it absolutely could happen here. Prisoners were injected with diseases disguised as vaccinations to study their effects to study the effects of untreated venereal diseases male and female prisoners were deliberately infected with syphilis and gonorrhea then studied prisoners were also repeatedly subject to rape by guards and you know that's something that we've done to people too with the syphilis specifically here in the u.s oh yeah sure we do all kinds of stuff in this country too Thousands of men, women, children, and infants were subject to vivisection, often without anesthesia and usually ending in death of the victim. This is one of the most horrific things I could think of because a vivisection means you're alive and you're awake. Yes. It's a dissection, but you're awake for it. Doesn't it, it doesn't mean dissection. Though. This is just, it's surgery on an alive, awake person, isn't it? Right, yeah. That's what I mean. Like, they're cutting open yeah yeah an awake 
person without anesthesia to right. look at their organs. Yeah, so you Sounds you know the person awful. has full consciousness. I mean, imagine what that's like. Vivisections were performed on prisoners after infecting them with various diseases. Researchers performed surgery on prisoners, removing organs to study the effects of disease on the human body. Prisoners had l- had limbs amputated in order to study blood loss. Those limbs that were removed were sometimes reattached to the opposite sides of the body. Some prisoners had their stomachs surgically removed and the esophagus reattached to the intestines. This is horror movie shit here, guys. Yeah. Yeah. What was and the point of the attaching limbs to opposite sides of the body? Just to see? Like, oh, we, well, whatever. Just they, to they're see fucking, what happened. They're not human. Let's just see what happens. Yeah. yeah. I mean, there were stories about like cutting off the like people's hands and then sewing the left to the right, right to the left. I mean, all kind of stuff. Mm-hmm just to see what it would be like. Parts of the organs, such as the brain, lungs, and liver, were removed from some prisoners. Imperial Japanese Army surgeon Ken Yuasa suggests that the practice of vivisection on human subjects was widespread even outside of Unit 731, estimating that at least 1,000 Japanese personnel were involved in the practice in mainland China. Well, that's not great. And like you said, with the science stuff, like that, that is their argument or, you know, was the argument of the Japanese was like, this is for science. This is going to help us win the war. And when are we ever going to, or in human history, or when will this happen again, that we have alive subjects that we can just take the organs out of alive and be able to see what happens. It's a great point. And again, yeah. And I think when you convince yourself and everyone else that they're not human, they're subhuman people, then that you justify it. You know, I think another aspect of this we didn't touch on is that the Japanese people viewed Emperor Hirohito as sort of a god. And so I think they were even more susceptible to follow orders, you know. People love That's gods. a good point too. Yeah, they were just completely, you know, subservient. They whatever he said goes. He's a, he's our god on a more whatever, a god on earth. Yeah, that's a good point. Unit 731 and its affiliated units, Unit 1644 and Unit 100, among others, were involved in research, development, and experimental deployment of epidemic-creating biowarfare weapons in assaults against the Chinese, both military and civilian, throughout World War II. Plague-infected fleas bred in the laboratories of Unit 731 and Unit 1644 were spread by low-flying airplanes upon Chinese cities in 1940 and in 1941. Jesus Christ, man. And they loved the fleas, man. That oh. was like their, they like struck gold when they figured out that they could, you know, get these, infect these rats and then Oof. get fleas to be infected. Did you know Mike ran Unit 68 in college in his frat house? That's what it was called. They would do him and he'd <laughs> owe them one. <laughs> Spoiler alert never paid back. <laughs> You know, when I was reading about this stuff, I found an interesting story about the U.S. doing this in San Francisco in 1950. Have you ever read this? No. They were testing like the same sort of stuff, like bacteria bombing a population. I have heard about this. I remember hearing about this at some point. Yeah, 800,000 people lived in San Francisco, and they took this boat, and they went just slowly up and down the coast of uh, San Francisco and blasted this, I forget what the name of the bacteria was, but... Not like lethal, you know, bubonic plague type stuff, but just something to see how it spread and dispersion techniques and stuff like that. So we do crazy shit over here, too. Oh, we're not perfect. No, <laughs> we're not. perfect. No, we're not. But it's an interesting Still story. Working. If you go read it, 1950 in uh, San Francisco. Also, we're regressing. <laughs> this military aerial spraying killed tens of thousands of people with bubonic plague epidemics. An expedition to Nanking involved spreading of typhoid and paratyphoid germs into the wells, marshes, and houses of the city, as well as infusing them into snacks to be distributed among the locals. Epidemics broke out shortly after, and many researchers found that paratyphoid fever was, quote, the most effective of the pathogens. At least 12 large-scale field trials of biological weapons were performed, and at least 11 Chinese cities were attacked with biological agents. 
An attack on Changda in 1941 reportedly led to approximately 10,000 biological casualties and 1,700 deaths among unknowing Japanese troops. God damn. 1,700 of their own guys. Yeah, they just said, fuck it. Yeah. Expendable. It's just weird. Like, you know, we do our show and we talk about serial killers and we're getting into like, you know, some of these guys killed 10, 20, 50 people even. Mm-hmm. This one biological attack, 10,000 people. Yeah. It's insane. It is. That's insane. And I would assume dying from the bubonic plague is not a pleasant experience. No, I doubt, I doubt that's the case. Japanese researchers performed tests on prisoners with the bubonic plague, cholera, smallpox, botulism, as well as other diseases. This research led to the development of foliation bacilli bomb and the flea bomb used to spread bubonic plague. Some of these bombs were designed with porcelain shells, an idea proposed by Ishii in 1938. That's a cool name. That's going to be our new band name. We're the defoliation bacilli bomb. Thank you. We love you. And we're We're here to fucking bubonic plague your faces off. (laughs) Rock and roll. (laughs) And then we're like spinal tap trying to find the sage. (laughs) 30 minutes later, we don't know where the fuck we're going. I hope our first live show, we can't find the stage. That would just be so awesome. I want to live out that spinal tap moment. We can do that. The little fucking mini sandwiches in the back where you give me that little bread and the little... <laughs> no one knows what I'm talking about. I have not about. watched Spinal Tap oh. in 30 years. Spinal Tap is a top 10 movie for me. <laughs> top 10. It is so good. Oh, Nigel Tufnell is my hero. It is really funny. I just want to get lost. Ian, have you seen Spinal Tap? No, I have not. Oh. I think you, you would probably enjoy it. I think you would like it. It's like an 80, like a spoof of a 80s hair metal band. And they're just fucking right. nitwits. They're just nitwits. <laughs> like they're in Cleveland and they're in the locker room and they can't find their way from the locker room to the stage. And they end up like in the boiler room and they're like the maintenance room. And they just, they can't get to the stage. Meanwhile, the crowd's cheering. Everyone's going nuts. And they can't find the stage. Just stupid shit like that. It'd probably happen to us at a live show. Just the name Spinal Tap is fantastic. <laughs> The, you know, and the thing I was reading about the the flea bombs when they used the porcelain shells was that when they were putting them in metal, they were finding that it was getting too hot for the it was killing a lot of the fleas. Mm. Like it was getting too hot with the metal bombs, so that's why they used porcelain because they would just shatter and fleas would go everywhere. See, minor alteration in the uh, design. Mm. These bombs enabled Japanese soldiers to launch biological attacks infecting agriculture, reservoirs, wells, as well as other areas with anthrax, plague carrier fees, typhoid, dysentery, cholera, or other deadly pathogens. During biological bomb experience, researchers dressed in protective suits and would, would examine dying victims. Infected food supplies and clothing were dropped by airplanes into areas of China not occupied by Japanese forces. In addition, poison food and candies were given to unsuspecting victims. Yeah, they said like the, the psychopaths would just be like Japanese soldiers going up to Chinese, you know, starving kids and, you know, acting nice, giving them, you know, candy treats. That's oh my God. That goes just back to like the subhuman thing. Oh, yeah. I'd like to think that most soldiers are not like that. It's just, but that's brutal. <sighs> History tells a different story, I think. I think in some cases, yeah. I don't know if in all cases, it, ugh. I don't know. I struggle with that. A lot of genocides in this uh, 20th century, even today. During the final months of World War II, Japan planned to use plague as a biological weapon against San Diego, California. The plan was scheduled to launch on September 22nd, 1945, but Japan surrendered five weeks earlier. Sneaky pricks, these Japanese in World War II. Harry Truman was like, fuck you. You ain't going to do this shit. (laughs) Dropping that bomb. Motherfuckers. (laughs) Did you ever read about the the hydrogen float balloon bombs that they made and sent them over? Yes. Like, that's crazy. I don't think most people know about that either. Like, they would just float big balloon bombs up into the the atmosphere. But would they get like 30,000 feet and those headwinds over the Pacific would... uh, Float them over to North America, and they did thousands of them. Most of them crashed in the Pacific Ocean, but this one landed in uh, Bly, Oregon, and like killed six people, five kids. And I a don't lady. remember hearing that one. Yeah, but, but the the yeah. they covered it up, and you know they blacked out those those stories so they wouldn't frighten people 
or you know give hints to the Japanese on uh, you know where it landed so they could kind of hone sure. the oh, coordinates yeah. and stuff like hush. that. Yeah. But some of those even floated as far nowadays, as nowadays that would never happen. It'd well, be fucking all over. Oh well, yeah. Twitter and Snapchat and Facebook and YouTube. And- it's my freedom. I'm allowed to say whatever I want. Yeah. <laughs> They're not wrong. They're also a fucking idiot. <laughs> but they got as far as Michigan, I read, some of those bombs. Like, that's crazy. Wow. If they could have honed that and started dropping sure. bombs all over the Midwest. Again, I go back to we dropped those bombs to save lives, Dave. I don't necessarily think that means we looked at them as subhuman. I think we were saving some lives. I, I just meant that. If you're the pilot and you're the one personally responsible for dropping that bomb, you have to rationalize I think, I think, something in your head when th- you incinerate 100,000 people. Yeah, and I, 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 and who, I mean, we're not ones to put ourselves in that mindset. No, so we I don't, don't know. I, absolutely not. I'm my just asking thought, the question. My thought would be you kind of just put that out of your mind, right? You just kind of do you your job. To. You just do your job. And yeah. Whereas I feel like compared to these Japanese soldiers, they enjoyed doing this. You know, they, they enjoyed yeah. torturing these subhuman, quote, subhuman people. I agree. I wasn't maybe, equating it. I'm just saying no, it's on I a understand. spectrum of sure. having to rationalize doing stuff like that. And that's, yeah. I do feel like there's probably a difference between the physical interaction of killing, slicing open a vagina, raping someone, mm-hmm. as opposed to just flying your plane and hitting like the, the button to, to drop a, oh, a bomb. Oh, Absolutely. You know, you don't have to see their faces or, mm-hmm. you know, they're, they're, they don't even exist as far as you're concerned. Yeah. They're, you know, I don't know. We're talking out of our asses. We didn't serve. We don't know. <laughs> we're pussies. We yeah. don't know any better. <laughs> In weapons testing, human targets were used to test grenades positioned at various different distances and in various positions. Flamethrowers were tested on humans. Humans were also tied to stakes and used as targets to test pathogen releasing bombs chemical weapons, and explosive bombs, as well as bayonets and knives. I got to tell you, I'm having trouble picking out which is the most terrific uh, part of the story so Seriously. far. I mean, god damn. God damn. I feel like the ba- like tying guys to the stakes and using the bayonets and knives to <sighs> test them is just like an excuse. Like, you know damn well they're sharp enough. Yeah, you know, It's just right. an excuse to go out there and kill them. Mm-hmm. In other tests, subjects were deprived of food and water to determine the length of time until they would die. Placed into high-pressure chambers until their eyes popped from their sockets. Oh, all right, I think I just heard one of them. <laughs> Those are, uh, <laughs> you know, and there's photos from the Holocaust because the air pressure tests were a big thing in Auschwitz. And man, mm. there are some pictures of some pretty high quality pictures of people being subjected to that. And it's, it's yeah, brutal. That's awful. There were experiments to determine the relationship between temperature burns and human survival, electrocution placed into centrifuges and spun until death injected with animal blood exposed to lethal doses of x-rays subjected to various chemical weapons inside gas chambers injected with seawater and burned or buried alive. Some tests had no medical or military purpose at all, such as injecting horse urine into a prisoner's kidneys. What the fuck is yeah, that? Like, what are you trying feel, to... What Like, what science is that? It's just fucking around. Yeah, mm. I feel like that's just coming up with some wild shit just yeah. to do. Army engineer Hisato Yoshimira conducted experiments by taking captives outside, dipping various limbs into water, and allowing the limb to freeze. Once frozen, which testimony from a Japanese officer said, quote, was determining after the frozen arms, when struck with a short stick, emitted a sound resembling that which a board gives when it is struck. Oh. This is this is the worst. That's I mean, it's hard to say because these are all yeah. terrible. This is so disgusting. And I think you posted one of those uh, frostbite pics. As that a was teaser the pic. teaser pic that, that we posted on awful. Friday. That was the hands of a person with the frostbite. Uh. That they would give these people and then let them live and suffer with that. Mm-hmm. Sorry, Ian, go ahead. I... Ice was chipped away and the area doused in water. Limbs brought close to fire and other, quote, methods used to determine the effect it had on frostbite. The effects of different water temperatures were tested by bludgeoning the victim to determine if any areas were still frozen. <laughs> this is like when you and I were talking, Dave, off recording about, you know, 
about Mengele and Ishii trading notes. I really wonder yeah. with a lot of these if the Japanese and the Nazis talked about some of the stuff because a lot of them are the same. Well, why wouldn't the they? same tests? Why yeah. wouldn't they? I mean, they were kind of allies at that point, at least in the war. Were, absolutely, yeah. So why would they not have? I absolutely think that's probably possible. Also, fuck you guys for excluding me from that conversation. Well, you were <laughs> peeing for the 50th time. <laughs> Sorry, Pally. Drink alcohols. <laughs> Unit members orchestrated four sex acts between syphilis-infected and non-infected prisoners to transmit the disease. As the testimony of a prison guard on the subject of devising a method for transmission of syphilis between patients shows, quote, Infection of venereal disease by injection was abandoned and the researchers started forcing the prisoners into sexual acts with each other. Four or five unit members, dressed in white laboratory clothing, completely covering the body with only eyes and mouth visible, rest covered, handled the tests. A male and female, one infected with syphilis, would be brought together in a cell and forced into sex with each other. It was made clear that anyone resisting would be shot. I guess, comparatively speaking, I would take that assignment over having grenades tested on me. But so even think about that, like you're already probably starving. You've been beaten down. Who knows what tests have been run on you or on your partner, on your partner. Sure. Yeah. Now you're at gunshot. You have to get an erection and fuck this girl. Yeah. Like, I I just don't. How do you even perform at that point? No blue chew. There was no blue chew back then. Mm. After victims were infected. They were vivisected at different stages of the infection so that internal and external organs could be observed as the disease progressed. Testimony from multiple guards blames the female victims as being hosts of the disease, even as they were forcibly injected. Genitals of female prisoners that were infected with syphilis were called, quote, jam-filled buns by guards. (laughs) Some children grew up inside Unit 731 and were infected with syphilis. A youth corps member deployed to train at Unit 731 recalled viewing a batch of subjects that would undergo syphilis testing. Quote, one, a Chinese woman holding an infant. One was a white Russian woman with a daughter of four or five years of age. And the last was a white Russian woman with a boy of about six or seven. The children of these women were tested in ways similar to their parents with specific emphasis on determining how long infection periods affected the effectiveness of treatments. Female prisoners were forced to become pregnant for use in experiments. The hypothetical possibility of vertical transmission from mother to child of diseases, particularly syphilis, was the stated reason for the torture. Fetal survival and damage to mother's reproductive organs were objects of interest. Though, quote, a large number of babies were born in captivity, there have been no accounts of any survivors of Unit 731, children included. It is suspected that the children of female prisoners were killed after birth or aborted. It just gets worse and worse. Yeah. Have you guys seen Men Behind the Sun? Uh, I have. It's been a, it's been a while. Is that the movie you wanted us to watch? Yeah, I Dave? thought we were just gonna watch it before we did this. Just I, I don't want to watch just, this at this point. It's, it's pretty what? horrific. It's from an actual what I remember. movie. It's a movie or a documentary. It's not a documentary, but they they get, they kind of label it as an exploitation movie. But it, it, the guy who directed it was just trying to get as close to the historical accuracy as possible. But it depends how you look at it. It's pretty fucking horrific, though, from what I remember. What's it called again? Men Behind the Sun. So it watch, was, uh, yeah, it was, watch at your own risk. Yeah, it was banned in Australia, and you know, and there's that's no a, holds barred penal Australia. colony. Yeah. So you know, <laughs> they literally allow you everything you need to know. They literally allow anything in Australia. Well, yeah, yeah. They drink Fosters, and we know how shitty that is, <laughs> and that's their favorite beer. They drink that like for breakfast, like you want their eggs and sausage and a Fosters. <laughs> so yeah, check it out if you can find it. It's on YouTube. The whole movie is it. I have a mm-hmm. copy of it somewhere. It's uh something else. Yeah, there's this the scene with the regarding how they how they viewed babies that they just grabbed a baby from one of the prisoners and just threw it in the snow and then just like kicked snow over it to smother it. It's just <sighs> brutal. Mm. While male prisoners were often used in single studies, so that the results of the experimentation on them would not be clouded by other var- variables, women were sometimes used in bacteriological 
or physiological experiments, sex experiments, and as victims of sex crimes. The testimony of a unit member that served as a guard graphically demonstrated this reality, saying, quote, One of the former researchers I located told me that one day he had a human experiment scheduled, but there was still time to kill. He and another unit member took the keys to the cells and opened one that housed a Chinese woman. One of the unit members raped her. The other member took the keys and opened another cell. There was a Chinese woman in there who had been used in a frostbite experiment. She had several fingers missing, and her bones were black with gangrene set in. He was about to rape her anyway. Then he saw that her sex organ was festering with pus oozing to the surface. He gave up the idea, left, and locked the door, then later went on to his experimental work. Come on, man. So like, that's the condition these people were left in. <sighs> this lady's bones are gangrene. She's fought frostbit. She's got pus coming out of like her vagina. <sighs> it's just disgusting and terrible and ho- horrific. That's the word of the day here, folks. Horrific. With the coming of the Red Army in August 1945, the unit had to abandon their work quickly. Ministries in Tokyo ordered the destruction of all incriminating materials, including those in Peng Fan. Potential witnesses, such as the 300 remaining prisoners, were either gassed or fed poison, while the 600 Chinese and Manchurian laborers were shot. Ishii ordered every member of the group to disappear and, quote, take the secret to the grave. Potassium cyanide vials were issued for use in the event that the remaining personnel were captured. So is this the one part in American history where we thank the Russians? <laughs> I mean, they got there, right? They got they they forced this the, all shut down. They got to Berlin too. We had our own issues to worry about after the fact, but yeah. at this point, go get them. Skeleton crews of Ishii's Japanese troops blew up the compound in the final days of the war to destroy evidence of their activities, but many were sturdy enough to remain somewhat intact. You know, I also read that the, the, when all this was taking place, they also let all the diseased, you know, bubonic plague rats that they had in there. They just let them free too, which so they went to you know various villages around there and ended up killing another thirty thousand people in the following two three years. So they killed all the people. But they right. let all the rats go. Yeah. Yeah. It's a good go kill more people. Yeah. Among the individuals in Japan after its nineteen forty five surrender was Lieutenant. Colonel Murray Sanders, who arrived in Yokohama via the American ship Sturgis in September 1945. Sanders was a highly regarded microbiologist and a member of the of America's Military Center for Biological Weapons. Sanders' duty was to investigate Japanese biological warfare activity. At the time of his arrival in Japan, he had no knowledge of what Unit 731 was. Until Sanders finally threatened the Japanese with bringing the Soviets into the picture. Little information about biological warfare was being shared with the Americans. The the Japanese wanted to avoid prosecution under the Soviet legal system, so the next morning after he made the threat, Sanders received a manuscript describing Japan's involvement in biological warfare. Oh, surprise, surprise. They probably got word of what the, the Soviets did on their way to Berlin, and they're like, yeah, we don't want any part of that. (laughs) <laughs> Sanders took this information to General Douglas MacArthur, who was the supreme commander of the Allied powers responsible for rebuilding Japan during the Allied occupations. MacArthur struck a deal with Japanese informants. He secretly granted immunity to the physicians of Unit 731, including their leader, in exchange for providing America, but not the other wartime allies, with their research on biological warfare and data from human experimentation. American occupation authorities monitored the activities of former unit members, including reading and censoring their mail. The Americans believed that the research data was valuable and did not want other nations, particularly the Soviet Union, to acquire data on biological weapons. (laughs) No, they did not. So just like we did with all the Nazis, we let these motherfuckers go. Yeah, the same thing as... You know, kind of Operation Paperclip. We just scooped up all that information. We got to the moon, though, right, Ian? Yeah, Werner Braun. <laughs> <laughs> Mike, we were talking about this one, European, too. Yeah, we were. It was a long time. <laughs> Probably. Ian said the swastika should have been on the, the rocket to the moon since the, all the Nazis are the ones that helped us get there. Boom. There you go. He said it, not me. 
Not us. <laughs> Aiden wants a swastika on the moon. <laughs> it did not say that. <laughs> You're taking it completely out of context now. <laughs> the Tokyo War Crimes Tribunal heard only one reference to Japanese experiments with, quote, poisonous serums on Chinese civilians. This took place in August 1946 and was investigated by David Sutton, assistant to the Chinese prosecutor. The Japanese Defense Council argued that the claim was vague and uncorroborated, and it was dismissed by the tribunal president, Sir William Webb, for lack of evidence. The subject was not pursued further by Sutton, who was probably unaware of Unit 731's activities. His reference to it at trial is believed to have been accidental. Like we said, under the American occupation, the members of Unit 731 and other experimental units were allowed to go free. One graduate of Unit 1644 continued to do experiments on unwilling Japanese subjects from 1947 to 1956 while working for Japan's National Institute of Health Sciences. He infected prisoners with rickettsia and mental health patients with typhus. Like post-war? Unwilling or unknowing? That's weird. Yeah, unwilling experiments from 1947 to 1956. What the fuck is that? Yeah, right? <laughs> God damn. What about Unit uh, 68, Mike? What happened to all those graduates? Sorry, I was looking at stuff on my phone. Oh. What are we talking about oh, here? That's great. <laughs> Sorry. We were talking about a graduate of Unit 1644, so I was wondering what happened to those hundreds of graduates from your Unit 68 that you used to run in the frat house. Well, they, Where are they now? They'd owe you one. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry about it. They'll get back to you. Ishiro Ishii, the chief of the unit, was granted war crime immunity from the U.S. occupation authorities because of his provision of human experimentation research materials to the U.S. From 1948 to 1958, less than 5% of the documents were transferred onto microfilm and stored in the National Archives of the United States before being shipped back to Japan. So we let these fuckers go and we got really nothing for it. Yeah. Mm. There was consensus among U.S. researchers in the post-war period that the human experimentation data gained was of little value to the development of American biological weapons and medicine. Post-war reports have generally regarded the data as, quote, crude and ineffective, with one expert even deeming it, quote, amateurish. Harris speculates that the reason the U.S. scientists generally wanted to acquire it was due to the concept of forbidden fruit, believing that lawful and ethical prohibitions could affect the outcomes of their research. The Japanese government has taken great lengths to deny what happened at Unit 731 and the massacre of Nanking. Japanese history textbooks usually contain references to Unit 731, but do not go into details about allegations. The New History of Japan textbook included a detailed description based on officers' testimony. The Ministry for Education attempted to remove this passage from the textbook before it was taught in public schools on the basis that the testimony was insufficient. The Supreme Court of Japan ruled in 1997 that the testimony was indeed sufficient and that requiring it to be moved was an illegal violation of freedom of speech. Also in 1997, an international lawyer filed a class action suit against the Japanese government demanding reparations for the actions of Unit 731 using evidence filed by a professor of Rikkyo University. All Japanese court levels found that the suit was baseless. No findings of fact were made about the existence of human experimentation, but the decision of the court was that reparations are determined by international treaties, not by national court cases. In August 2002, the Tokyo District Court ruled for the first time that Japan had engaged in biological warfare. Presiding Judge Koji Iwata ruled that Unit 731, on the orders of the Imperial Japanese Army Headquarters, used biological weapons on Chinese civilians between 1940 and 1942, spreading diseases including plague and typhoid. However, he rejected the victims' claims for compensation on the ground that they had already been settled by international peace treaties. Well, goddamn. And that is Unit 731. <laughs> Thanks for that great story, Dan. That was so much fucking fun. And they still, to this day, deny or downplay that most of this took place, the Japanese government. Yeah, I was reading there is a, there's a strong nationalist m movement in, in Japan with these, these you know, history revisionists that 
if, in, if not completely deny it, just downplay it to where mm-hmm. it was like pretty much nothing. Or they'll say it wasn't 30,000 people. It wasn't like 100 people. Right. You know, and I was looking More at like some of this. A couple hundred thousand. Yeah. One of the worst, the worst thing that I saw a guy, it was an eyewitness testimony. And he said he saw like a six foot tall glass jar and inside was a, like a Western guy, probably Russian, like just in formaldehyde, like a pickled human cut vertically in half. Like, can you imagine that? No. Like, I mean, that's, that's fucking like that's crazy. out of like a sci-fi movie. Yeah. Like, that's fucked up. Yeah. I don't know. I'm supposed to go to Japan next year. They might block me from going now. I'm exposing all of this. <laughs> well, we're allies now, Dave. It's all right now. <laughs> but this is uh it's pretty horrific what people can also, do. Also, you're not gonna do a lot of Japan. Other. You're an American. Like yeah. fucking this virus, you're not going anywhere, pal. Yeah, I got a couple of years before I can leave the, the country. The world maybe. is smarter than us. You're not going anywhere. <laughs> Disclaimer on men behind the sun, there is a scene that really made me like kind of close my eyes and turn my head when they uh there's real rats and they throw a real cat in the room of rats and the rats eat this cat and it's all real and it's real close up on this cat being just like mauled by rats this is what you want us to watch dave like fuck that i'm not watching that shit (laughs) i hate cats i just don't want to see that i was like turning my head and i was looking at i'm like that cat really looks real and I kept turning my head, and then I, I Googled it, and yeah, it was a yeah. real cat. They well, they say it. it's an exploitation movie, but yeah, they were going for the realism, I guess. Mm. Yeah, and then in the scene where it destro- where you know they start blowing up Unit 731, I, I, it's, got, it's hundreds of rats. They just fucking set them on fire in the movie and kill mm. all the rats. Yeah, for real, they, real let, they let them go. <laughs> yeah, and set them on fire. Yeah, in real life, God, they let them yeah. go. I haven't seen that in a long time, but I do not remember it being great. Yeah, I'm not going to watch that movie. It might offend your uh, sensibilities. What am I wrong? Shouldn't. I've slaughtered some pussy, but I'm not trying to watch it happen <laughs> by some rats. Slay all day. <laughs> right. Hashtag slay all day. <laughs> uh, I don't know how to like transition here. It's horrible, but I think in the interest of their in public, the interest of the public... Uh, this is a story that's not knowing told. about these things. It's not told. I, I think it's something people should know. So. I don't think this is a story that like if you search podcasts, you're going to find a whole bunch. It's our civic duty to bring this story to the people. I really do. In all fairness, I think I take pride in the fact that we cover stories like this and, you know, things that people may not might not necessarily hear about. And oh, it's something you should know. This is a part of world history. So. Absolutely. It happened. Like we're not this this isn't a conspiracy theory. This no. isn't like aliens. This isn't UFOs. This isn't something that you could debate. Like this happened and then, you know, take it from there. And it could happen again. Absolutely. All right. Okay, bye. <laughs> <laughs> now go home and question your humanity. All right. Yeah. Let's let's we'll let we'll end this on a lighter note. I got a I got a few topical questions here. Ian, you ready for this? I know you just read a bunch of heavy shit. You ready for some? Dave, we get on time? We got 20 minutes. <laughs> Literally 20 minutes? Literally oh, 20 fuck. minutes. All right. We'll go quick. Real quick. Ian and Dave, one of these, one of these has to go. Means you throw it out and it's erased from civilization and history. It never existed. So I won't even remember it. Though. You wouldn't even remember. No, that makes it easier. One of these has to go. <laughs> Movies. The Indiana Jones franchise, the Die Hard franchise, the Matrix franchise. One of those has to go, and it's gone forever. Oh, Indiana Jones. I don't even have to think about that one. It's the only yeah, one I like. Indiana Jones, too. It's the only one no, I've liked. Gone. No, Fuck Bruce Willis. He's a piece of shit human being. And <laughs> oh, the my Ma- God. And The Matrix is the most boring movie of all time. Dude. I, just... fall, I fell asleep three times trying to watch it. It's terrible. It's so bad. I've seen The Matrix a hundred times. It is probably. so bad. It's awful. Die Hard? <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I don't even know how Die Hard is, but Bruce Willis is a piece of shit. Fuck him. Indiana I'll give Jones. you a good story, though. It's great. Indiana Jones, Raiders of the Lost Ark came out in 1981, I want to say. And I was a little kid, and I went to the drive-in, I think, with my parents. And they were watching Raiders of the Lost Ark, and I turned around, and there was some softcore porn. Oh, you've Mar- told this before. Marilyn Chambers and the <laughs> other movie screen. Apparently, that was a thing back in the 80s. I'm disappointed that you guys both shit on Indiana Jones so much. They're not great. They're dumb. It, I've and, never and, even a seen Bruce, any of and a Bruce and a Bruce Willis movie is better. 
compare, I'd, re- I'd watch Die Hard like, over Indiana Jones all the day table long. We're using, fantastic. The table we're using has a higher RQ than Bruce Willis. Hey, you don't know Bruce <laughs> Willis. Damn. He's just not great. He's not good. He's you not good in anything. Bruce Willis. He sucks. <laughs> Fuck you, Bruce Willis. All right. Indiana Jones is not great. But I got to see my first softcore porn movie. Dr. Jones! Movie. Dr. Jones! Well, you got to, okay, so that should, so, that should raise that up in your Holds a, a place in my heart. Raiders All of right. Lost Ark. All right. I'll behave for the rest of these. I only got two more. Uh, 80s rock bands. You got to get ru- rid of one front man. Axl Rose, Steven Tyler, James Hetfield. Steven Tyler. Aerosmith's awful. Okay. These are easy. Yeah, I wanted to say Steven Tyler, but Axl Rose, he's a douche, so... Hmm. I'll agree with Dave though. Yeah, Steven okay. Tyler gone. Aeros- yeah, Aerosmith is fucking Aer- Aerosmith garbage. is terrible. <laughs> quick, quick note. I saw. He's got a note for everything here. <laughs> fucking this guy. Uh, on the Appetite for Destruction tour. Yeah, and there was Guns and Roses. porn paint playing in the background. <laughs> Guns and Roses open for Aerosmith, and I went to that tour. And uh, hint, they were both terrible because they're just terrible. Okay. Well, Aerosmith is just garbage music, but. Guns N' Roses, I thought, thought was going to be much be better. better. It, was, it was not great. That, Slash that first the tour, thing. anyway. Slash was the yeah. only good one? That first tour was not good. All right. Did Axl Rose show up late for that tour? I don't remember. I don't think so. They were the opening band, so no. Okay. All right, last one I got here. You got to get rid of one. It's easy so far. I, uh, you know what? I tried. <laughs> <laughs> you got to get rid of one. <laughs> Chipotle, Taco Bell, and your personal favorite Mexican restaurant. I don't have a personal favorite Mexican restaurant, so I'll get rid of that. Okay. Yeah, I'll get rid of the personal favorite Mexican Jesus restaurant Christ, in a God. second. God damn. We're torpedoing this fucking guy yeah. tonight. I got fucking nothing then. All right. So Chipotle or Taco Bell? I'm going to ask that. Chipotle or Taco Bell? You got to get rid of one. Oh, that's what a do you tough get rid of? one. I, I agree. Can I be honest with you? Sure. Of course you can. I'm getting rid of Taco Bell. That was my immediate yeah. thought. Yeah. But before I blurted it out, I wanted to give it a little more consideration. I think I'm getting rid of Taco Bell. I'm getting rid of Chipotle because there's lots of times that I'm awake at like two, three in the morning. I'm like, man, I'm real hungry right now. That's a good point. That's true. That's a good point. Dave, you're never awake at two or three in the morning. No, (laughs) no, I'm not. (laughs) So that's not even a concern for you. I'm keeping keeping Chipotle. I agree with you, Dave. I love Chipotle. Here's the thing. People shit on Chipotle all the time. Why? Or tell you that there's things better than it. I don't get it. There is nothing better than it. I love it. Like people try to tell me that what's the um, Qdoba? Qdoba is not better. better. Yeah, it's it, not better. Qdoba couldn't be a blemish on Chipotle's ass. <laughs> <laughs> like it's not even close. Moe's, get the fuck out of here. I'm not been, even. I think I've been to Moe's. Moe's. Nah, it's not like, better. Don't tell me that something's better than Chipotle because I promise you it will lose. I agree with you. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. I've had wine and beer oh, tonight. Shit. Oh, are we over? Are we done? All right, so let's wrap this up, and we'll get to uh, some Patreon shout-outs. Uh, we got some new ones here this week. Thank you very much to Clark Kobe, Jamal Jackson, Amanda Huzwanga, Adam Hagenson, Suzanne Wagner, Heather Wigman, Holly Chase, David Dennison, Dawn Barnes, Deja Angstat, Richard Walrus, Whitney James, and Susan Brogan. Thank you guys very much. We appreciate your patronage. We are at patreon.com slash Necronomapod. Ian, what do you got? For iTunes, I have one for KJXWMW, Buner King, Aviana Drew, What Chin, Lady Eliza Jane, um, one that is just a bunch of underscores, and Boosh. Thank you guys for the awesome reviews. I guess I never did do a quick... Um, like last thing on, do you guys have anything else to say on this topic? Ian, do you have anything else you want to wrap up with, with uh, this topic? No. Do we cover no, it all? I think in a couple of weeks we'll get into uh, a little more fun aspect of World War II. A little more, uh, a little more conspiracy well, stuff. Spoiler yeah. alert, everything's going to be more fun than this one. Fucking Christ. Yeah. We could do but, BTK uh, again. It's going to be more fun than this shitty episode. Yeah. All right, Dave, you got anything else for this episode? For this episode, no. I would just like to to wish Megan the Stallion a speedy recovery in her recent foot injury. I hope she's doing better up there. Goddamn, pal. Big fan of Megan Favorite jerk-off material over here. 
And I also, I would like to throw something out to all the victims of Unit 68. I'm going to start an investigation into the, the happenings at Unit 68. So if you'd like to tell your story, contact me. Hey. You want to talk about, you want to talk about <laughs> all sub- victims of Unit 68. <laughs> you want to talk about subhuman war crimes, Pally. I drop bombs. <laughs> if you never got your plus one, let me know about it. All right. <laughs> we are at Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, at Necronomapod, patreon.com slash Necronomapod. If you're interested in buying some merch, amazon.com, search Necronomapod. You can also get stickers at our website, Necronomapod.com. I'm going to see how many times I could say Necronomapod in 15 seconds, because apparently I've said it a lot. Uh, this was maybe the most intense, worst episode we've ever done. It's not great. And this is episode 99. 99? What comes after that? Goddamn, pals. Can you believe it? Did you guys ever think we'd get to episode 100? I didn't think we get to episode six, and that's a shoot. That is a shoot. That is a legitimate shoot, and we'll save that for another conversation. I, honest to God, did not think. Ian just told me to come talk to him. I figured we'd go sit in his basement. We'll drink some beers. We'll talk. I'll get no downloads, and then he'll just invite me still over for UFCs, and I wouldn't have to worry about fucking talking on on a microphone. That Here you are, a year and a half later. Wow. Huh? All right. Hey. Next week, we're partying because it's an episode 100. I'm going to see you guys then. All right. You guys ready for a cool down beer? Cheers. <laughs>